She was just about ready to chick a sea of frickin. Yes. Yeah. Well, chick a sea of frickin. Chick a sea of frickin. Cut you away. Yeah. When all of a sudden there was a lightning flash flight and standing in front of her was a beautiful berry. <laughs> and Cinderella said, you are who, what, who you want. The beautiful berry said, I'm your Mary Fod Godmother. <laughs> it wasn't her Mary Fod Godmother. It was one of you all dressed up as her Harry Godmother. <laughs> Cinderella said, oh, Mary Fod Godmother, may I go to the fancy breast draw? Her Harry Godmother said, "Sigh, wordly. Why, certainly. So instantly, Cinderella was transformed into a banishing Rudy. Fashion beauty. She had a long white gown, sound necklace of poopies and merls, rubies and pearls, and on her feet were two tiny sass glippers. And she was off. And she cast the camel and came to the castle. And the first two people she met were the two sister uglers, but she was so beautiful, they didn't even send her eyes recognize it, right? Yeah? So they took her to the prance of hands. And he said, Wow, may I dab this hands, have this dance, but she is so beautiful, she reminds me of the beeping slutty. <laughs> And he was just about ready to ask for her, for her hand in marriage. Yeah, when all of a sudden, the star started strikes well, and Cinderella banned from the ball. Banned from the ball. But as she was doing so, one of the tiny sass clippers flipped from her shirt. <laughs> and the prance and hints went over and picked that up. I said, as soon as I find out who's sit, the slipper sits, I'll know with whom I'm lolling in fun. It's a love story, so falling in love. Yeah, so the dairy next name, he went from house to house, you know, pillar to post, those can't be turned around. He wanted to find out. Who's the flipper shot? Yeah. He came to Cinderella's house. The flipper, he tried the flipper on the first sister yard and it fit and did. He tried on the second sister yard and again it fit and did. Fit and did. And then it was Cinderella's turn. We all know the flipper pitted so effectively. Yeah. And the Prance and Hints and Cinderella were married and happy literally ever after. And what do we need to learn in this beautiful story? Never give up. Yeah. Benjamin Franklin never gave up. Thomas Jefferson never gave up. Oliver Twiddly D. Who's he? So you don't know, because he gave up. So, <laughs> yeah, nugget. Always nugget. 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 Always remember this simple little philosophy as you walk on the pathway of life. You know, some are stones are trawl, some bubbles are trig. I'm trying to have any hubbles. How are we going to grow strong? Yeah, grow strong. So, remember, if you're ever the fancy breast straw, just slop your drink. So, <laughs> don't try to memorize that story. After a while, you get all messed up. You start to think that way. But Cinderella's life went from pathetic to perfect to why. She never lost the thought that she had the potential to be a princess. Life is all about how we think and how we feel. When I was a little guy, a little guy about this tall, still am. But anyway, when I was a little guy about this tall, I grew up in central Utah, Richfield, Sevier County, a suburb of Richfield called Glenwood. A very small community, 300 people. Everybody respected, supported, trusted each other. I would wake up every day, and I would look at those beautiful mountains and those wide open spaces, and I knew in my soul, life was full of unlimited possibilities. My dad was a high school basketball coach, and I was being primed by my amazing father to be an exceptional athlete. Well, I grew to be about your height. And we moved to Orem. Orn, Utah, the land of orchards. And I was now this tall. My best friends were Roger and Phil and Doug. And we would listen to the Beatles, chase girls, play sports, not in that order. Anyway, on, <laughs> on this particular day, I'm going to tell you about my best buddies were waiting for me at Lake Ridge Junior High School. Yeah, the entire school and community all excited about the big championship game the next, the next morning against our cross-county rivals from Provo. You know, I fixed my little sister Julie's flat bike tire. I remember the day I'd been on my feet for over 5,000 days. And I walked down the street and I jumped off the curb. And I ran across the road and I jumped up on the curb and then I ran to the grass, leaped up on the porch, started banging on the old screen door. My buddy Tori, my teammate, he's a punter, I was a quarterback. Tori said, Mike, Mike, come in, come in, come in. So I opened the door, I'm walking in the house, where's my friend? Can't find my friend. All excited about the last practice, big game tomorrow, down the hallway, bedroom's on the right, bedroom's on the left, got to the end of the hallway, I could go right or I could go left, I went left. Bad idea, into his mom and dad's bedroom. And I plopped down on the white bedspread, waiting for my friend, where's my friend, I'm thinking about life, my girlfriend's kind of cute, I'm glad, big game, anyway, just sitting there. Where's Tori? And I heard somebody walking down the hall. Hmm, it's, it's Tori. He walked around the corner, it was Tori, and he was holding a gun in a brown leather case. Mike, I like to play around with this gun. This is my dad's off-duty police gun. I know where he hides it when he goes to work. 
I sat there, I listened, I was curious. I grew up hunting and fishing. Tori stopped three feet away, took the gun out of the brown leather case, flipped the cylinder, holds the bullets out, and the sights were shaking the gun. I watched four little silver bullets come to rest on the white bedspread. I could have reached out and picked them up. I started doing math in my head. I got to four. Hmm. I wonder how many bullets that gun does hold anyway. I should have said something. This was an accident. I thought my buddy had an empty gun. He did too, very playfully. He takes the safety off, flips it back in with a Russian roulette, pulls the gun up to his hip, points it at my chest. Bang! I still remember that sound, that power, that echo, that bullet hit my chest, punctured my lung, clipped my heart, hit my spine, slammed me back onto the white bedspread. I passed out. My friend freaked out. I was regaining my consciousness. I couldn't breathe. This can't be real. My friend's here tonight. My friend's here tonight. These things are real. Death, divorce, failure. And I panicked for the first time in my life because this was real. I'd been shot. My legs didn't work. I'm running out of air. My friend's freaking out. My mom's five houses away. And I started bargaining with heaven. You ever done that? Start bargaining with heaven. If I can live, I'll change. If I can live, I'll be a better person. If I can live, I'll help people. I just want to live. I'm young, a great life ahead of me. And then I saw a blue phone on the wall before cell phones, about eight feet away. I couldn't get to that blue phone. It was like I was glued to that white bedspread. I stared at that blue phone, wishing I could call my mom, and then I died. So I thought, then Tori, was in my face, violently shaking. Hey, Mike, you're faking it, you're faking it. And no, you're faking it. He's hitting me, pounding on me. I pulled up my shirt, showed him the hole in my chest. He ran back over the same blue phone. Who do you think he called? My mom. Mrs. Shalapi, come quick. Mike's been hurt, that's all he said. Mrs. Shalapi, come quick. Mike's been hurt, chucks the floor in the corner. Runs back in the kitchen. He's like sharpening his cutco knives in there. And I'm like, get the butt back in here. And I'm like laying there. And I'm, I'm just, and, uh, and I'm just hoping my mom will figure this out. And the next two minutes were the longest two minutes of my life. But I hung in there. Why? I had hope. We all need hope. You need hope. I had hope that my good, incredible, wonderful mom would figure it out. And you know what? She did. And she showed up. She touched my hand, touched my face, ran her fingers through my hair. My mom saved my life. My mom ran back with that same blue phone. Who do you think she called? Ambulance. Finally, yeah, picture this. <laughs> My friend's dad's a policeman. He's cruising the neighborhood. He came across his police radio. There had been a shooting at his address, his house. And uh, he showed up. Ambulance has showed up. They rushed me to the hospital there in Provo, the same hospital you see today. Eight days in intensive care. Didn't know if I was going to live. Local newspaper said, boy shoots himself. <laughs> yeah, that's what Tori told their boy shoots himself. Father leaves loaded revolver on nightstand, star athletes, student like president clinging to life. I went rock bottom for the first time in my life. My nickname as a kid was Happy Shalappy. And for the first time in my life, I became crappy Shalappy. I lost my identity. My girlfriend dumped me three days later. Her name was Annette Barton. Anyway, that's all right. I found a new one. But so this was hard. <laughs> My football teammates dedicated the game to me the next morning, 36 to 0. Oh. They lost. Yeah. <laughs> Things weren't going too well. I was even mad at God. This isn't fair. I'm an athlete. I use my legs. These things should happen to like chess players or, you know, something like that. So all this stuff going on in my head. Oh, I smiled. My friends, like you, packed the elevators. They'd, they'd come to the hospital. I'd smile. That felt good. My mom and dad would see the hospital. They'd all go home. I'd go rock bottom. Didn't know if I wanted to live. Mad at the world. Mad at God. I saw a plug in the wall one day, and I thought about falling off the bed, crawling over there, and pulling the plug out of the wall, and ended it all. But I wasn't raised to quit. I had a choice right there and then. I could go that way, or I could go that way. I had to create like a game plan for myself. How am I going to deal with this? This wasn't a short-term thing to get through intensive care, to get through rehab. This was a long-term thing for me. I hope this ain't just a summer thing for you. I hope it's a multiple thing, a multiple year thing for you. So I had to figure it out. I had to change. In life, if you resist change, you fail. 
You accept change, you survive. No, you, you create change, you succeed. No, you, yeah, so I had to figure it out. I had to change. I had to do things different. Different isn't bad, it's just different. Then Tori showed up. My buddy that shot me came to the hospital. He sits next to me, we look at each other, we both started crying, he gives me a book. I open it up, he had written, Mike, I'll never forgive myself, but I hope someday you will. Your friend Tor. This didn't just happen to me. This happened to my family, my future, my kids, my grandkids. I knew I was on my way to recovery when I started causing trouble in the hospital. <laughs> I hadn't laughed in a week. My grandma Schlappy brought me a cherry Slurpee from 7-Eleven. Nine o'clock at night, I drank half the Slurpee, put the remainder on the nightstand by the hospital bed, went to sleep. Nurse came in, checked my blood pressure, stuck a thermometer in my mouth, left the room. I'm 15, I need something to smile about. I took the thermometer out of my mouth. Where did I put it? <laughs> in the last half of the cherry Slurpee, I hadn't finished. 15 minutes, nice and cold. I hear the nurse coming down the hallway. <laughs> Just before she comes back in my room, took the thermometer out of the Slurpee, put her back in my mouth, out of move. She walks in, over the side of the bedroll. She, she yanks this thing out of my mouth. She gets all nervous and hysterical. Why? This little thing that doesn't lie said I was dead. dead. Yeah, 30 degrees ago. And I, I got in trouble. Have you ever been in trouble? I got in trouble. But I laughed for the first time in a week, and that meant everything to me. And I started to love myself from the inside out, not just the outside in. I watched my legs get skinnier and skinnier. I promised myself Friday afternoon, November 18th, 1977, I'll never let my thoughts, my dreams, my future atrophy. The average person here tonight has 11 negative thoughts to every one positive thought. Wow. I was twice that many at that point. The average person here tonight spends 45 to 50 minutes a day looking good for the world on the outside. Some of us a little less filled. I mean, on average, 45 <laughs> to 50 minutes a day. We need to spend even half that much time working on our insides. I got great therapy. The greatest therapy I received, I gave myself. You know what I called it? Attitude therapy. I would memorize poems, positive thoughts, read good books, anything I could do to stop myself from going rock bottom. By the way, I'm not here tonight on this beautiful evening to tell any of you great folks you can't have a bad day. It's okay to have a bad day once in a while, especially if you've been shot. Yeah, but don't <laughs> let a bad day turn into a bad week, a bad month. You hang your head. You think you're no good. You think you don't matter. You're good just because you're alive. I lost that feeling for a few days. I don't even want to go back there. Five months in rehab. It was hard. I'd work up a sweat every day trying to make my big toe flinch. I would touch the bullet that was still in my spine, think about all the things I'd lost. I wondered if I could ever get a job. Would you hire me? See, that's why I had to go into motivational speaking. I'm not very good at climbing up the steps and ringing the doorbell. So I, I had to go into some, I wanted a girl that ever liked me again. Now I live in Draper. Five kids, one grandkid, a couple wives, Utah, welcome to Utah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So I had to figure it out. But I just wanted to get the heck out of rehab and go home. And one day, they brought me a chair. And I'd been in my wheelchair for like a few weeks, so I was pretty good at cruising around. I was learning to pop wheelies and a little, you know, all in all. But they brought me a chair, a chair like this. And one day they said, Mike, if you can. If you can get in that chair, we'll let you go home. And I looked at the chair and I thought, if I can't get in that chair, I can't get in the car. And if I can't get in the car, I can't drive. And if I can't drive, I can't go on a date. Can't go on a date, can't get a girl. Can't get a girl, might as well pull the plug out of the wall and end it all. Anyway, <laughs> so they brought, me, they brought me this chair. And you put your right foot in, and you put your left foot in, and then you, you transfer. Now, not a big deal, but it is a big deal when you don't have any leg muscles, hip muscles, stomach muscles, hanging on to everything. I have a little secret for all of you in here. You wanna be a good friend? You wanna be a good person? You wanna be a good rep? 
You want to be a good manager, help other people feel comfortable in your world. You want to be a great friend, a great person, a great rep, a great manager, get into their world. Get into their world. Like my 11-year-old sister, Julie, got into my world. She literally became my private nurse. My family was there for me, be, in, be there for each other. My dad, we went in the backyard, grabbed the basketball, shot it up at the 10-foot hoop. It fell five feet short, I was bummed out, my dad knew it. Mike, you can still be a great athlete, just gonna have to do it a little differently. Thanks, Dad, yeah. I found out they had wheelchair basketball in the Olympic Games. I set a goal when I was a little younger than most of you, be the first wheelchair basketball player to represent the United States of America in four consecutive games. In our lives, we don't know where we're going, we're not gonna know how to get there. My mom, my mom's my hero, I'd wake up every day. This wasn't a dream. My wheelchair was waiting for me at the side of the bed. I'd climb in my chair. I'd roll in the kitchen. My mom and I'd talk. We'd do the dishes. Cut go nice by hand. Anyway, we'd do the dishes. <laughs> and my mom would cry when I'd dry. And she stopped. Mike, just because you can't stand up doesn't mean you can't stand out. <laughs> what a great motto. Thanks, Mom. I hope you have a motto. I sit here in front of you as a person. I used to be able to do 10,000 things. Now I can only do 9,900. Yeah. I can't do laundry, <laughs> garbage cans, windows. Even got out of piano lessons because I couldn't play the little pedal thingy. <laughs> It was worth getting shot to get out of piano lessons. <laughs> so I got shot. What's your problem? What stops you? What paralyzes you? I wouldn't leave the house. Fear was setting in. Walls were caving in. Fear this, fear that, fear. Fear, forget everything and run, or face everything and ride. I had a choice. I chose the latter. I remember the first day I went out the house, down the ramp, down the street, curb felt like a cliff, grass felt like a jungle. I'd go to the end of the street, count a few cars, turn around, go home, stay inside for a few days. And then I went to a basketball game at Orem High School. Orem High, the you, Orem High. Orem Tigers, yeah, Tigers. I was the Tigers for two years. Golden Tigers. I was supposed to be out there with my brother, starting guards for three straight years. Where was I? Sitting in the wheelchair section. I hated it. I hated it. I hated it. I'd cry through the whole game. I wanted to be out there with the coaches, the teammates, the cheerleaders, and I was sitting up there in the wheelchair section. And I'd cry through the whole game. Negative labels. Disabled. Handicapped. Crippled. What off. Yeah. Did I say it right? <laughs> yeah, shun. Did I say it right? <laughs> so all these negative labels. University of Utah. Anyway, um, <laughs> so all these negative labels. Go I'm gonna go crazy. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go crazy. I gotta find something to do. So I started running marathons. Any runners in here? My first marathon, July 24th, yesterday, mm -hmm. 1981. The Deseret News Marathon, halfway between Salt Lake City and Park City, first 13 miles are uphill. Me and a bunch of other dudes are in wheelchairs. They let us go first, so we won't be in the way. I'm gonna get back in my chair. And, uh, oh, hang on. Sorry. Nice. We good, Daniel? Yeah. Yep. Awesome. I thought we were gonna have two disabled mics, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That just happened. So, where was I? Oh yeah, my marathon. So they let us go first. We're in wheelchairs. We'll let them go first. They won't be in the way. Three miles into the race, uphill, 10 more miles, sweat, blisters, FUD. What's FUD? Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt, FUD, but I wasn't raised to quit. 10 more miles, I'm gonna get there, one push at a time. I kept pushing along, pushing along. If I didn't push, I'd go backwards. I know you gotta push after this, so if you don't push, you're gonna go backwards. I kept pushing, and then they let all the ABs go. The able-bodied people, kinda like you, and all the ABs are passing me on the uphill. 
and it's depressing. And this guy in a yellow shirt runs by and hits me on the shoulder. Good job, Mike. Don't quit. You're an inspiration. He keeps going. I'm staring at his rear end. Thanks. <laughs> Shut up. Wait till the downhill. <laughs> <laughs> then there was the downhill. Picture this. 500 runners looking over their shoulder, seeing eight guys in wheelchairs coming after them at 45 miles an hour. <laughs> yellow shirt. What do you think I thought as I sped by? Good job. Don't quit. You're an inspiration. I'll see you at the finish line. You get to the finish line. You've been there. Liberty Park. Everyone's clapping. That felt good. 100 miles to the end. I'm, wait a minute. You were all clapping three hours ago when I took off. Now you're all clapping at the end. What about the 26 miles in between? You know what I learned that day? Here's a nugget. All motivation is self-motivation. Let me say that again. All motivation is self-motivation. Oh, love, money, fear can motivate you, but we have to get our rear ends out of bed in the morning, be thankful to be alive. I never appreciated my legs till I lost their use. And I crossed the finish line that day, head up, shoulders back. My dad's right. I can still be a great athlete, just gonna have to do it a little differently. Now, my friends here tonight, I'm a pretty smart guy. I've met a few of you, but I know this. Every chair in here has some pain. Pain. Tough stuff. I salute you for getting out of bed and dealing with your stuff. A lot of people don't understand. But thank you for having the courage to want to do the best you can and to fight through your pain. You want to know the secret to getting through pain? Attach a purpose. Attach a meaning. If someone said, Mike, cut off your hand, I'd say, no thanks. Well, maybe it's a real sharp knife. I would, but no thanks. <laughs> Oh, Mike, will save your grandson. Oh, I'll do it in a heartbeat. I started attaching a purpose and a meaning to all this pain. And it's made all the difference. And I hope you do the same. I was just getting used to this new world of mine. I was now a junior in high school. I would actually go to school once in a while. I had a new girlfriend. Life was good. Fourth period, I was arm wrestling our weightlifting coach. He was strong, I was stubborn. We're doing our thing, my girlfriend's in the room, and he busted my arm. Back to the hospital. More surgery. Four limbs, and only this one worked. Circles for five months. But, Something more important happened in the hospital. They flipped me over, sliced open my back, took that little 38 caliber piece of lead out of my T10 vertebrae. They handed it to me, I held it, I started shaking. This little piece of lead symbolized so much loss and heartache in my young life. But I can look every one of you in the eyes tonight, I can let every one of you know it's about the time in my life I let it go. I let it go. What do you have that you need to let go of? I let it go. I got the let out, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> I forgave my friend. I've been sitting on my butt for 41 years and eight months. So you won't sit on yours. I completely forgave my friend. We hung out. We were like neighbors. We lived five houses away. We'd go to the mall. We'd go to movies. Once in a while, people come up, mine. What the heck happened to you? Oh, he shot me. I mean, <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> kind of awkward. Well, my buddy Tori moved away, got involved in drugs and alcohol, tried to rob a bank with a loaded gun. 25 years in federal prison. Many of them in Fort Leavenworth. <clears throat> Through it, I had a prayer in my head and in my, someday I'm going to reconnect with my friend. A few years ago, I was, I was hanging out at a restaurant on 7200 South here in Salt Lake City, my cell phone rang. It was Tori, I knew the boys. Tori, come to the restaurant, we gotta, we gotta connect. He came to the restaurant, he walked in, we went to shake hands. And he walked right through my handshake, he knelt down, we embraced, it was like a bridge had been built over those many years. I'm proud of my friend, Tori. Despite his past, he has his future positioned properly. Attitude is not a move. Attitude is not a mood. I can be happy slappy, I can be crappy slappy, but that's my mood. It's okay to have good days, bad days. Attitude is a position. You don't believe me, look it up. Attitude is a position. 
Ask any pilot what his most important instrument on the airplane is. He'll tell you it's his attitude indicator. It tells him the position of his airplane in relation to the horizon. Attitude is your position. So we can have good days, we can have bad days, but we get ourselves positioned properly into a bright future. And that's what you're doing today. That's what you're doing tonight. But you gotta do it on your own, on motivation, <coughs> self-motivation. Anyway, I'm proud of my friend, Tori. Put his past behind him. He's heading into a bright future. Well, I got that blue cast off my arm, and I found myself on a hot August day, a very hot day, kind of like today. I was at Provo Canyon, Deer Creek Reservoir. You ever been there? I didn't know if I could swim, but I was willing to try. I put my life jacket on, I fell in the water, and I started dog paddling. Now, my dad had created this big, round, ugly, yellow wooden board. He tied it to the boat. I'm laying on my belly, hanging off the deer light, but not my head. He takes off. He's going like 35 knots, 35 miles an hour. And I'm just hanging on. Like, I look like an injured frog. Legs are flat. I'm just hanging on. Water's hitting me in the face. And I'm, this isn't very much fun. Why did my friend shoot me? I'm having a bad day. I'm hanging on. Everybody's laughing, having a good time. And then everybody's still laughing, having a good time. People on the shore laughing, having a good time. What's wrong? This isn't any fun. I look over my shoulder. My legs are flapping in the breeze. <laughs> but there was a worse problem. The water that came under the yellow boogie board ripped off my sporty green swimming trunk. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I, I can't feel my legs, right? But I'm not blind. Anyway, so I quickly fall off, and I'm bobbing up and down in my life jacket, and I'm trying to be all positive. Maybe I'm the world's first new disabled water skier. But you want to know my real thoughts? These are my real thoughts back then. It's not my fault I'm up here in freezing cold water. It's not my fault I lost my swimming trunks. It's not my fault I got shot. My friends here tonight, question for you. Do fault and blame really have much to do with anything? No. We don't need fault unless you're 